dude, I gotta, I gotta stop. I gotta stop dressing up as furries for my videos. People are gonna start getting the wrong idea. <laughs> also, these bunny ears are too, they're too tall. I can't get them, I guess I could get them in the shot if I lean up against the wall, but then I don't have a lot of space. I overthink things way too much on this channel. It's just, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Hello? 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 Uh, well, if you're hearing this, then chances are you've made a very poor career choice. Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a household name at this point. It took the internet by storm in 2014 with the most popular video of the game made by Markiplier with his Let's Play series. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would. And since then, this franchise hasn't let up, with games coming out from the franchise as recent as current year. In 2022, we got the release of FNAF Security Breach, which is the ninth installment in the game's canon. And let's not forget the movie adaptation in the works by Blumhouse. Five Nights at Freddy's is an indie franchise that is almost as big as AAA titles like Mario and Sonic. But what makes Freddy's a lot different from a lot of other online communities is that the fan games have kept the scene alive. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive! There are plenty of criticisms of the games that get overlooked such as repetitive gameplay loops, lack of gameplay overall, an overly convoluted story. But in the grand scheme of things, none of that really matters. Because what really carries the FNAF franchise are not just the big names playing it, but also the games inspired by the franchise. That then also gets played by those big names, i.e., you know, Markiplier, Doco, MatPat, etc. The fan game scene got so big, creator of the franchise Scott Cawthon would summon all of these fan game devs to establish a community that would help fund these projects and elevate them to the same level as Scott's games. This became the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative. Over the course of the last three years or so, the Fanverse has helped many game devs achieve game promotions, like of which they could have never imagined before. With Scott Cawthon's support and influence, a brand new installment to the Fanverse project meant more than just being a regular indie horror copy of a pre-existing piece of work. It means standing out on your own despite being a copy of someone else's work. And thus, this collection of fan games expanding and putting their own creative spin on the gameplay was creating massive strides in the indie development scene. But as quoted in... Corinthians? You know, I thought that this shit came out from Jurassic Park. You know, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. I thought that was the quote. I thought that's where that was going. I was not thinking it was gonna be the Bible. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it, and packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it, well? Okay, you know, that shit. You know what I'm talking about. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That saying. Just because Scott encouraged all of these creative endeavors, and wanted to support the game dev community, doesn't mean that all of them should necessarily exist. From the blatant FNAF ripoffs to downright inappropriate and scandalous to what this video is going to be about today. There are just some fan games that cross the line. We've seen stories of fan game developers going too far behind the scenes, but never has there been a case where a game is so interconnected with the developer crossing the line. I think it's fair to say that just because Blackout can make a game doesn't mean he ever should have made Dormitibus. Drop on in, guys. This one's gonna be really fucking gross. I have the chat logs, so let's get started. My name is Lazy Bedhead, and this is Bedline on LZB. Get it? The Chris Hansen reference. Funny, because I'm back in my Chris Hansen era. God, I hate my job.
appearance at Freddy's, in a story sense, is highly disturbing and Although the story at this point is super confusing and makes no goddamn sense at all, there was a time where people were genuinely curious about where the fuck this thing was gonna go. I mean, the way that Scott tells his story is somewhat fascinating, as his first three games show a use of bouncing back and forth in the timeline to paint a full picture. The first game established our main line of characters and timeline, then the second game goes back in time to the precursor of how we got to this point, and then the final game goes forward 30 years to wrap everything up, and then Five Nights at Freddy's 4 and Sister Location are just like, there for flavor text. And then there's Pizza Simulator that burns all of those pesky lore-related answers down to the ground. <laughs> so, very vital plot holes and derivative questions get completely ignored, but it's totally fine because this ends. For all of us. I know everyone and their grandma probably knows the story behind these games by now, but for like the 0000000.1% that doesn't know anything about Five Nights at Freddy's, here is the quickest summary of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mentally ill. <laughs> ah, shit. Here we go again. Five Nights at Freddy's is an indie gaming franchise starring William Afton. Oh no, he's hot! Welcome oh, to Freddy movie? Fazbear's Pizzeria, where fantasy Pizza and pictures. fun come to life. Hit it, guys! He makes robots. He has this friend named Henry Emily. They start a Chuck E. Cheese knockoff company called Fredbear's Family Diner. Fredbear's had two yellow animatronic characters that Afton built. Fredbear the Bear and Bonnie Bunny. Fredbear's was super popular and got a spin-off show with a bunch of extra characters that later got their own animatronics. That includes Chica and Foxy, who people draw smut of for some reason. <laughs> Don't let your kids watch it! They also expanded to a sister company called Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental. So, here's this massive franchise that has two restaurant chains open and they are making bang. What could possibly go wrong? Until William's daughter and son are killed by two of his animatronic creations. And he goes fucking crazy. After Circus Babies was put in a hole underground. And Fredbear's was shut down. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was open in its place, with shiny, new, plastic, kid-friendly animatronics, similar to that of the shiny aesthetic from Circus Babies, but also, being anthro characters, like with Fredbear's. The only catch is, that these new animatronics were made basically to survey kids and parents, and seek out criminals in a criminal database. Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. As if the FBI made these things. You see, after Afton had lost both of his kids to his animatronics, he started getting suspicious that his robots could harbor the souls of dead kids. So he started killing kids to test his theory. One of his first victims was his friend Henry's own daughter, Charlie. I am the danger. <laughs> Charlie would possess this animatronic puppet that Henry built to protect Charlie. Hey yo, what the fuck? In the sense of this wonderful thing we call. I. So, at some point in the story, five kids were murdered, and Charlie, as the puppet, put their souls in the older animatronics that once were used at Freddy's. And all these dead kids would then shut Freddy Fazbear's down. Until it didn't. Surprise, Shawty! In 1993, the old animatronics from Fredbear's were reused to reopen Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Yeah! There was only one problem. These animatronics smelled really bad. Like, they smelled like human remains. Do you smell that? It's like something's burning. Is that my pussy? Yes. Ah! It is. And no one decided to investigate that whatsoever. Oh yeah, and they are haunted. The animatronic characters here do get a bit quirky at night. Plus, the pay sucks. Ooh, that's kind of small. So like, it's not even worth working there. And popularity with the brand wasn't super cash money. With the dead kids and all. So they shut down. Alright, get lost all of you, you fired Guan Scram. Get out of here, you moochers. That's right, keep moving! You know what? You know what? Yeah. Except you, you stay! 30 years later, Fazbear Frights opens. It's a haunted attraction that is, in no way, associated with the Fazbear brand, but basically acts as a haunted house. But in the Five Nights at Freddy's universe, everyone, including yourself, 
playing as the night guard in every game, or a child in that one, is really fucking stupid. So, this guy on the phone tells you, the night guard who is stupid, that they found something left behind from the older location, that being the yellow bonnie animatronic, now named Springtrap. You see, Springtrap has the rotting corpse of the Fazbear CEO inside, walking oh around like an animatronic god, zombie. Oh my god, that's bad, oh my god, my eyeballs poking through my head, and it's just really gross now, oh man. You know what, I think the happy song time is over. How did he get there? Well, when William was going on his murder spree, he killed children by luring them away in this animatronic suit hybrid. Fredbear and Bonnie from Fazbear's Diner are both animatronic and suit. The only problem is that they are incredibly unsafe. If you breathe wrong, or are exposed to excessive amounts of liquids, like water, or sweat, then the spring locks that snap the suit into animatronic and suit mode will go off, and then you'll be crushed to death. So, in some sort of desperate panic to get away from the ghost of these kids he's haunted by. Why are you running? Why are you running? Captain hides inside the Springlock Bonnie suit. He gets crushed to death. He ends up getting locked away. Until he's rediscovered and put in this haunted attraction. The robots have become more sentient. They started to know my name. They don't even say. Whoa. How did you know my middle name? I remember everything. Three years! I've been in here for three years! Please stop, your mother would be very disappointed. Which burns down. <laughs> Fucking whoops. But Afton is still alive. Mainly because this franchise can't kill him off for the fucking life of them. Anyways, so Afton's two kids that died, possess the animatronics that killed them. That being Fredba, and Circus Baby. Circus Baby wants to get out of that hole she was trapped in. So, she scoops out a guy's guts, and walks around in his skin for it a bit, until it rots away, and she hides in the sewer. Afton fucks off for a while, and a new Freddy Fazbear's pizza opens. Another one. Only this time, Henry Emily is back and calling the shots. He makes this new restaurant, to basically try and lure Circus Baby, Springtrap, and his daughter inside. Once everyone is in place, he burns the restaurant down with everyone inside, and gives one of the most iconic speeches of the entire franchise. Connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth. If you still even remember that name. Yeah, yeah. Great speech, bud. But no one cares. Fuck off. And then I guess Afton uploads his consciousness to a computer. And then these two games happen. And then there was a bite. Hi there. Was that the The end. Three days. It took me three days to edit four minutes. Fuck me! Dorminibus originally was designed to play very differently than what it turned out to be. Dorminibus is a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game set in Scott Cawthon's canon universe. Now, in the FNAF fan game community, games are placed into three separate categories. There are the games with original characters but set in the same FNAF timeline, the games with an original story but use the same set of FNAF characters, and the games with the same FNAF characters and story but serve to expand on the original timeline. Timeline. Games with original characters but set in the same FNAF timeline would be anything with a completely new set of characters and playstyle, but their storyline has something that ties them into the Five Nights at Freddy's universe. This would include things such as Pot Goes, or Candies, or Jollies, and Rachels. However, there are original FNAF games that utilize FNAF characters, all while telling a brand new story. And this would include things like Juniors, or Fazbear Frights, or The Joy of Creation, and my personal favorite, The Glitched Attraction. Games that have the same FNAF characters and story also exist, but they serve to either retell the same story or expand on it, such as with FNAF Plus, or Return to Bloody Nights, or Shadow Awakens. In the case of Dormitibus, I would say that this goes under the last category. Most of the characters utilized and locations are already preset in Scott's universe. This game takes place after the events of Five Nights at Freddy's 3, after Fazbear Frights burns to the ground. Which might sound interesting, but I assure you, it is not. Dormitibus's original development structured the game to be a point-and-click free roam game. It was in development hell for seven years, with game developers like Onitrick, Super Arthur Bros, 
and Steven Mater at the helm. All three mentioned are 3D modelers with various backgrounds in other FNAF fan games. Currently, Arthur and Steven are inactive, with their only works being modeling work for this particular game. However, Onitrick has more under their belt. They've worked on modeling work for games like Sea Shifts at Austin's? I, I don't know. The Return to Freddy's 5, which, by the way, the Return to Freddy's as like a franchise is fucking insane. That could honestly be a whole other video because holy shit. And their own canceled game called Many Nights at Lenny's. But their most notable work is with this game. And it is also the most notable game of the head director, Blackout or Nietzsche. And we shall return to them very soon. Anyway, so like I mentioned before, the original beta for the game was to be a free roam where you try to escape Fazbear Frights before 6am. It was similar to a shadow over Freddy's, but there would be the addition of 8-bit minigames that would further establish the lore. This was back in 2015, but the idea was scrapped and the game was converted into a normal FNAF fan game. And when I mean Normal, I mean a 10 night structure with multiple areas you need to manage and keep an eye on multiple animatronics out to get ya. But anyways, the full game was finally released February 26, 2018 and was picked up by the FNAF Let's Players, including Markiplier, which I'm sure a lot of people forgot about this, but yes, he actually did play this game, which is how I found out about it. What I didn't know at the time was the insane lore of this game and the personal hell hidden within. So the game begins establishing that this was 12 nights before, because in a game series called Five Nights at Freddy's, it would only make sense to have 12 nights. The phone guy, who is named Peter, by the way, refers to the player as John. Your name's John? 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 I think it's John. Well, uh, my name's Peter. So my fire's like John. I stay up till John. I got this shit. I got my life on the line. John Wright, the character that you play as, has died and is in a purgatory that was pre-built off of the memories at Fredbear's Family Diner. Despite this clearly being the Fazbear's Fright location, and the game jolt page clearly states that you died in a fire, which insinuates that this is taking place after the ending of Five Nights at Freddy's 3, but whatever. Oh, also, I forgot this part too. It, the cardboard theater ending indicates that you burned down Fazbear Frights, but I guess this is Fredbear's why? I don't know. But anyways, the phone guy explains that he has a plan to get you out of this purgatory and that your little hellscape is infested with corrupted and demonic-like versions of the animatronics. Now, that's just in the 2018 official release. In 2022, they released a remaster of the game that kind of shortens up this entire explanation because the phone guy on night one doesn't ever know when to shut the fuck up. So the phone guy explains based on this new shortened version of night one that these animatronics are the ghost of your childhood bullies and two kids that went missing in 1986 which is very specific i must point out it's like a okay and they see you as a source of plasma okay so instead of wanting your skin to walk around in or to stuff you inside of an animatronic you're now like a food source, I think? Now the FNAF franchise is nothing without its animatronics, so the question is, where are they? Well, one of them is active on night one and is referred to as Havoc Freddy. And that's an ugly pickly bitch! So that's what we're dealing with. Look, we'll get into the like the animatronic details later, but just know that Freddy isn't even the worst of it. I mean, it's pretty bad. It's gross, that, that's for damn sure, this is disgusting. But it's unfortunately not the worst. So the phone guy throughout the game explains his theories on what's going on and how and why we are all here, kinda. He explains that the reason that the animatronics look like Mangle rejects is because someone or something made an attempt to manifest them into physical bodies out of thin air, which if that sounds stupid, even when I'm trying to explain it, in-game, it is equally as fucking stupid. But in order to not look like that, they need a source of plasma to fix themselves. So you're more like a Duracell battery than a food source. And I think when he's talking about this, he might be referring to Molten Evil as the plasma source that made them all like this, but 
I don't know because it's never explained and it's fucking dumb. But things get weird on night five because phone guy becomes an entity coming after you as golden call. But not really. It's like his physical remains are just roaming around and like, but the menu also says that he's a kid named Kyle. I don't know. But anyways, getting rid of him is such a pain in the ass, but we're not there yet. Also, phone guy finally tells you his master plan after six nights of doing this shit. So the tapes that the phone guy explains on night one that you have to collect, these tapes have audio recordings that explain the events of the game and how we got to the point that we're at now. And he explains that by collecting them, it will bring peace to the animatronics and send everyone to the other side. So by that logic, what are on the tapes? Uh... Wanna know how I got these scars? Well, I'm the Joker, baby! <laughs> these tapes that you need to find throughout all of the nights in order to achieve the good ending, along with the cardboard theater, explains the events that led up to Dormitibus. Now, technically, you don't get access to the cardboard theater until you beat nights 1 through 10, and they act more as, like, a minigame to the main set of nights. The minigames have you play as the man in the tapes that you collect, and that man is Garvey Wright. Garvey Wright? Just like John Wright? The lore. So the tapes and the cardboard theater documents Garvey's crimes. And what are those crimes? You may be asking. Well, you know, just like the same crimes that the purple guy commits in the FNAF series. You know, so like child murder, conspiracy, slaw, so stress, torture, uh, stalking, this year, besides stroke, mutilation, kidnapping, corruption, property damage, psychological endangerment, and sabotage. You know, just like in FNAF. Oh, and also, I guess the reason why this guy kills kids is because he has a weird genetic skin condition that actually turns his skin purple. I didn't really want to do this. I didn't want to start doing this again. But they just won't shut up about it. It's not my fault. I can't control my physical mutations. So he is a literal purple guy. I wish I was kidding. And I don't know who did the voice lines for the purple guy, Garvey, in this game, but he's doing a really bad Joker impression that makes him more sound like Onision than it actually does the Joker. <laughs> Look, I don't know if Blackout actually did the voice work, but it sucks, and it's bad, and I hate it. I tracked him into my purple car and brought him to my basement. He bled out real quick! <laughs> So Garvey Wright is basically the William Afton of this universe. And he goes on a murder spree because of purple skin racism. In 1982, Cake Bear's family diner... Uh, okay, so according to this canon, the bear that delivers cake to the kids in the FNAF 2 minigame, you know this one? Yeah, so apparently this is its own restaurant. I thought this was Fred Bears. I don't- I guess what this is insinuating is that Purple Guy killed a child outside of this restaurant to basically get rid of competition. But I thought that this was Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, not Fred Bears Family Diner. Or I guess it's Cake Bears. I- I don't understand what's going on. You know what? It doesn't really matter. Okay, so uh, Cake Bears closes after a body of a child is found thrown away in a dumpster or something. And its owner, Alex Wright, I guess everyone is fucking related in this story because of course. Every last name that is revealed for every person, like every human character that you see in Dorminibus has right as their last name. So I guess everyone is related. I don't know how, and I don't care to find out why. Anyway, so the owner of Cake Bears sells the brand. Year later, in 1983, Garvey does the uh-ohs with a minor, which is not discovered until after the restaurant closes down for a different incident. What was that incident, you may be asking? Well. Three days after that assault that went unfounded, it turns out that Purple Guy paid this bully character to stuff the crying child in Fred Bear's mouth. It took five dollars to make a teen put his little brother into the mouth of the Fred Bear suit. <laughs> All the blood. <laughs> Which is like, yeah, that's wonderful. I hate that. So then, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza from FNAF 2 opens in 1985, and Garvey uses the spring trap suit to kill kids and stuff them in the suits. And then, in 1987, a security guard is killed, as well as the Bite of 87, because 
you know, FNAF lore wouldn't be FNAF lore without the bite. Was that the bite of 87? Anyways, so it's implied that this security guard guy is either Fritz Smith, who is the name of a character in the FNAF franchise, but I don't know why this one-off name is just thrown in here from FNAF 2. My personal guess is that this is the game's way of skull-fucking me to death. You know, for fun. So anyways, in 1993, the phone guy from FNAF 1 dies in Night 4. Wow, this game incorporates FNAF lore so well. Okay, so I guess in this universe's canon, Golden Call, right, is also the phone guy from FNAF 1, which, you know, that makes sense considering what happens to Phone Guy canonically after Night 4 in the first game. However, the Phone Guy in this game is also revealed to be Peter Wright, who is Alex Wright's younger brother. And Peter and Alex are also related to Garvey, so I guess they're all brothers? I think? Alex is supposed to be like the Henry Emily of this story, I believe, but I still... I, n I have no idea what the fuck is going on. In the final sequence of the cardboard theater, your character's name, John, appears, and then everything starts burning to the ground. So this is the ending of FNAF 3. And yet, your character also wakes up in a purgatory that is similar to Fazbear's family diner. I don't know. But the point is, I guess this insinuates that John was the one that burned down Fazbear's frights, I think. And that's the story... I... I believe... I... I still don't know how any of these characters are related to each other despite them all having the same last name. I still have no idea how any of these characters are related, by the way. And honestly, I don't think it really matters because, like, the calls in every night contradict each other so much that it doesn't make a lick of fucking sense. All I know is that I don't feel comfortable with anything anymore. So the game ends with the 10th and 11th night facing up against Garvey as this elongated spring trap. You leave the establishment with a quick time event, which admittedly the animation in this game is kinda cool. And then you find your grave, which calls you a brat, scum, and waste of air. I still don't understand why the purple guy has issues with Freddy's because he doesn't seem to be the owners of Freddy's in this canon timeline thing. But then again, if he's not the owner, then how does he have access to the parts and service and like, What's Garvey's deal with John anyways? Like, why does he need to kill John? Also, if he has an issue with killing family like it says in tape 9, then why does he hate John? And why did Peter bail him out? And what is this family dynamic? I am literally losing my mind. So yeah, uh, that is the terrible, gross, exploitive, too much information kind of, I'll explain, uh, story mode of this ugly looking game. And when I say that it's uggo, I really, really mean this game is uggo, dude. I've never- I haven't even seen this- the <laughs> <Thumbs King. laughs> Why is it weird that that way? This kid's name was Thad. So, the cast that we are dealing with is... Granted, the most diverse looking cast of characters that I have ever seen in a FNAF game. And that's cool and all but it also comes at a detriment. There are three different Freddy-esque characters in this game. Four if you technically want to count the BOA because I believe that the main figurehead that I presume is the brains of this operation here is this toy Freddy head here. But technically the characters are divided into four types. The Havoc animatronics, the Freddies, the Frankenstein abominations that look stupid as shit, and Garvey. Let's start with the Havoc animatronics. Havoc Chica is the corrupted soul of the 15 year old that Garvey uh, uh ohs. The Havocs, design wise, are designed to be in this torn up apart, messed up way, the same way that the Mangle is in FNAF 2. But it's also like super duper confusing. Unlike Mangle, I think that there is some logistics to how they're supposed to originally have been put together. And in a way, I can logistically see how this thing would function and move. Like, logistically, if you look at the exoskeleton design from FNAF and then look at the Mangle, you could kind of see how this thing was just torn apart and poorly put back together by kids. You know, because that's the gimmick. And a lot of that I have to give credit to Scott's attention to detail because he looks at the things that he designs and he takes that into account when he's trying to create the mangle because if he just kind of eyeballed it here, then it wouldn't look right, but he actually, you know, thought it through. And you know, that's great, but uh... 
I don't know how the Havocs are supposed to function. I know that's kind of the point considering that they're made purely off of memory and like some fucked up purgatory or whatever, but uh, I cannot legit figure out how this thing is even supposed to move. Like I see that these characters have moving models that don't actually get utilized in the game ever. And also, I am not convinced that this thing would not just keel over the moment it actually starts to move. This thing with its arms and neck punching outward, it's way too top heavy. There's nothing here that convinces me that this thing got corrupted to look like this. I mean, you can barely tell who this is supposed to be. Also, Chica has this cupcake that also has a chance to kill you in game, but it's very inconsistent whether she actually has the cupcake or not. I wouldn't even know that Chica had a cupcake in this game at all if I didn't read the tutorial instructions, which, yes, the phone guy is actually so bad at explaining how to save your ass that you have to read how the animatronics work, which is just, that's just bad. <laughs> it feels like a complete afterthought, just like this design. 2 out of 10. Okay, so you thought figuring out how Havoc Chica fucking works was hard? Well, Havoc Freddy is just a disaster. <laughs> like, what the hell is this thing that... Is that supposed to be a tail? Why does he have two arms to use to hold one mic? Look, the reason why the mangle has extra parts is because of the novelty of her character. She is a tear apart, put back together attraction for kids. So kids put them back together with the parts provided, as well as extras that they leave out for the kids to be creative and such. There's no reason any of these characters should look like this. One out of 10. Okay, I'll be honest. Havoc Puppet is like the only one that I actually kind of like. I don't think there's anything that indicates that this is supposed to be a puppet design because it doesn't have any signature features that would give that away, but I still think it's pretty neat. I think this idea of it being a disembodied puppet head with all of these tentacles coming out of the mouth is very interesting. It kind of gives off this feeling of like, I'm no longer on strings, I am the strings with like the tentacles replacing those strings and being part of like the puppet's control. Like, I, I like it, I like this. And if you look at the original concept art, it's super fun too to look at. I'll give this one a seven out of 10. Havoc Foxy is the worst design out of all the Havoc animatronics. Like I can sort of see how the other two function and move, but Foxy? One of his legs is just a hook rotating around. It doesn't even touch the floor. Like, I'm pretty certain that his leg is this thing way up here, but it acts like his tail or his arm. I don't know. But also his arm is in his mouth. And also there's just this endo head hanging out of his head like this. Like, let's be for real. If they're gonna do a bunch of Mangle ripoffs, then why didn't they just copy off of the original Mangle design? I mean, it wouldn't have been original, but it would have been better than this. Why is an exoskeleton hand just hanging in between his legs? Is that a penis? Why is there a hand where his penis is? <laughs> Negative a million out of 10. Also, Foxy is the only character that actually moves in this game, and the animation looks horrible. <laughs> like, his head completely shifts off mid-frame, and I ask again, how do these things move? Like, how the fuck does any of this work? So now that we are done talking about the Havoc animatronics, we can talk about the Freddies. The two Freddies that roam around aside from Havoc Freddy is Golden Call and Cake Bear. Golden Call is the one that I want to talk about the gameplay preemptively just for one second. Because this guy and Foxy work together. Without Foxy, you would not be able to deal with Golden Call. So how Golden Call works is that he will send a Trojan to your computer. Not that one, you dirty bastards. Then you have to check on Havoc Foxy and Cam 5, where you have to type in a password on Havoc Foxy's sign. Now this could be either dates or whole ass sentences, but you don't actually have to type out the entire sentence because that shit would take too long. So you have to type out just one word off of the sign, but you don't know what word that is. So in this screenshot, the sign's password is miss me, John. But I don't know if they want me to type the word missed 
or John. But keep in mind, Foxy has their own mechanics too, and you have to watch him like you do in FNAF 1. But once he leaves, Golden Call will send a Trojan, and you have to check Foxy to see him gone. Type the one word that you don't know what to type, and then run to the other side of the room, and then look at Foxy until he leaves. So essentially, you are doing two separate things to manage and deal with two characters, Fuck these two. It also doesn't help that Golden Call is just a Golden Freddy design, just with more blood and a phone, which kind of sounds cool until you realize it's supposed to be the phone guy from FNAF 1. And I feel like other than all of the purple guy slander that phone guy got, they did him so fucking dirty here. The only thing I can say about Golden Call is that at the very least, his jump scare is kind of cool. Other than that, it gets a negative 10 out of 10. Okay, so what the hell is even a cake bear? Besides being, you know, the Freddy Fazbear animatronic with no ears. Well, according to this game's lore, Cake Bear is the bear that serves kids the cake in the death mini game from FNAF 2. And, you know, call me crazy, but I don't think that these death mini games and the sprites are meant to be taken literally. But anyway, so Cake Bear, or Am I Real, which is a stupid fucking name, his whole deal is that he is basically a Springtrap version of Freddy, and it looks really bad. I think this character design is a great transition to talk about textures. All of the textures for all the characters in this game are pretty bad, but Am I Real gets it the worst. Most of the textures blend into the textures of the background, and the static doesn't necessarily help either, so it just looks really ugly and bad. Also, I don't understand why an animatronic bear would have buck teeth. Also, the way that Am I Real kills you is with a cake, and not like he, he doesn't actually have his own jump scare in game other than this one time, which is a separate thing. He sends a cake after you, but the cake looks too similar to the cupcake. So when I die to this thing, I don't know if I got killed from Chica or him. And honestly, it looks more like a sandwich than it does a cake. I have no idea why a cake would be the thing that kills you when dealing with this. The cake is a lie out of 10. And finally, let's get into the worst designs in the entire game. The Frankenstein monsters that are the BOA and Soul Cage. I'm gonna talk about both of these characters at once because they both have the same issues. Design-wise, they are both way too top-heavy with these incredibly small legs that they walk on. Both of these designs are supposed to be a combination of multiple characters. The BOA, or the Box of Abomination, is a hybrid of all of the parts in the box from FNAF 3. And the Soul Cage is a lamp with four heads of the four main animatronic characters, presumably from this screenshot at the end of FNAF 3. And they're just, they're bad. Look, I don't think I need to tell you that looking at a prop and a random promotional poster for the game and saying, man, you know, that would be a really cool enemy is a stupid idea. The BOA has the same issues that I have with the Havoc animatronics, as in, I legit don't know how the fucking exoskeletons are supposed to be assembled or function. Also, and this is just an issue that I have with like the other characters too, but their arms, whatever part is supposed to be their arms anyways, they are far too long to a point that it's like, how do their tiny little legs carry themselves? And I can't emphasize enough how dumb the fucking lamp design is. I Like, I can't express this enough. One of these enemies is just a box prop from FNAF 3 on popsicle sticks, but also lamp. Ah uh, yes, the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise with iconic characters such as lamp. And don't forget desk fan, cause yes. <laughs> I'm gonna rate both of these a desk fan out of 10. <laughs> and I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry, did, did I forget someone? Did I forget something? Oh, I forgot two other animatronics? That's weird because I I could have I could have sworn that I talked about all of the original character designs. I mean you do have Garvey and Molten Evil and well what can I really say about them? One is just like an elongated like spring trap design and the other one is literally just Bonnie from FNAF 2 but color swapped. That's it.
I mean, you know, granted, they are the better looking designs overall, but like, they didn't do anything with them. They're just and they have filters over them. That That's it. I think the only reason Garvey looks okay is because I kind of like how he moves. I don't know. I, I kind of like it. But there's no originality to it. This is just a long spring trap. And this is just a black toy Bonnie. What more do you want me to say? Rip off out of 10. Dormitibus is somehow the most lackluster, yet the most confusing and frustrating gaming experience I've had in a while. The thing that makes this game piss easy is the fact that the way you deal with most of the enemies in the game is just to stare at them. Unlike other FNAF games where the player has to, at the very least, close a door, or reset a system setting, or put on a mask, or wind up a music box. The game's strength comes from stressing the player out to avoid the fear, and if the player is unable to do so, they are punished with a jump scare. Here, the most multitasking you'll have to do is just deal with Golden Call and Foxy working together, and that's about it. Other than that, it's just staring down a bunch of animatronics until they go away. The thing that makes this incredibly frustrating is the RNG. RNG stands for Random Numbers Generator, and most FNAF games work in this way. It's where things that happen in the game to challenge the player seemingly happen at random points. Now, normally most RNG in FNAF games try to be fair, with the task not being too daunting enough where if events were to overlap at random points, then it technically wouldn't be a big deal. Here in Dormitibus, the RNG is so unnecessarily cruel and unfair. The RNG in this game should be simple as just to stare shit down until it goes away, but if you need to stare down a bunch of animatronics at once, only some of them require you to be at one side of the office, whilst others require you looking at the cameras, if that is all happening all at once, you can't substitute ignoring one of them while dealing with the rest. They all have to serve an immediate priority, otherwise you're fucked. You know how in FNAF 2 you can kind of prioritize Foxy being at the end of your hallway by just flashing him occasionally? You can still do that whilst winding up the music box and checking other areas. And this is because Foxy being at the end of your hallway, although can happen at any time, it doesn't take immediate priority. You can balance all of this through overlapping tasks. Here, any overlap and it's a definite game over. You can sort of deal with it all, but if you're being harassed by Soul Cage above, the puppet behind you, and you have to type in a password all at the same time with limited time between each of them before they decide to jump scare you, you're basically screwed. Speaking of the jump scares, they're not great. The only one I can really think of that I sorta kinda like is Golden Call and Garvey. The rest of the jump scares cut to black with a stinger sound effect, so you know it's coming. It doesn't make the jump scare work at all if the jump scare has to announce that it's coming. Also, given that the characters overlap and the RNG is so unfair, on top of all of that, the game is buggy as shit. The game is incredibly unstable. It crashes on you completely at random, which sucks because you don't know what exactly you did to prevent it from happening again. So you're basically just at the mercy of the game crashing on you. The most I can say is that the game only crashes on you after you die, which is bad if you suck at the game and die over and over and over again. And there's like a bunch of other things too, like assets just randomly disappearing, animatronics disappearing, sprites just hovering in front of the screen for no reason. But I think the worst offender is what happens when you hang up on the phone guy. The game literally punishes you for hanging up on the phone guy by turning off all sound and most of these characters require you to have sound to counteract them. You won't survive past a minute. I, I literally cannot emphasize this enough. This game will literally punish you for skipping out on this quiet ass fucking phone guy for hanging up on him so that you don't have to listen to him ramble about some random fucking bullshit. This game needlessly punishes the player over every little thing. And sure, it would be kind of funny if it were like a joke or a hint to the lore. And I guess this kind of counts as an Easter egg, but considering that this game already punishes the player enough by barely functioning at 
all. This is such a dick thing to do. Now, believe it or not, this is actually not a video game review. I know, it's crazy, because it, it certainly feels that way, doesn't it? But if I didn't want to review this entire game, then why make this video at all? Well, it's because I don't want you playing this game. I don't want anyone supporting it at all. I, I don't. I don't want there to be a remake or a remaster in the works because giving this thing any sort of validity to exist means we are giving this man Blackout the platform to share his art. But Lazy, why can't he share his game with us? He should be allowed to make and share his art. We should support indie game devs. And yes, normally I would agree. If Blackout wasn't a fucking pedophile... <laughs> Blackout went by many names online, Nietzsche being one of the most common ones, but his legal name that he has also gone by publicly is Justin Nicola Cannonberg. Nietzsche, or Blackout, is the creative director of this game, and I'm not gonna pussyfoot around this for too long. I'm just gonna cut to the chase here. Nietzsche slash Blackout is a pedophile. Allegedly. Although, I don't even think I need to say, you know, allegedly at this point, because the moment that the leaks came out of him having little chats with a 12-year-old, he completely abandoned his game jolt page, leaving this message for his followers. Jesus Christ, just leave me be. I don't want to live in your heads rent-free. I've moved on, and you should as well. Well. Doesn't he just sound approachable? <laughs> Now, before Dormitibus, Blackout actually did some modeling work for a few Five Nights at Treasure Island games, including the unofficial remake of Five Nights at Treasure Island in 2017 and The Nightmare Before Disney. He also made parody games of other pre-existing FNAF games. Nietzsche started indie programming at just 14 years old and had made his name known in the early FNAF fan scene. But just because he had the clout in the scene, that doesn't mean he was very well liked. In fact, even before the initial controversy that drove him off the internet, Nietzsche was also hated for generally being a toxic person. During 2016 to 2018, Nietzsche would pick a lot of fights on Twitter with game devs like Kane Carter, the creator of Pop Goes. Most of the beginning of this document outlined a timeline of events of Nietzsche just being an overall douchebag. He's been accused of harassment by multiple people, blackmail, he's been accused of cheating, false advertising, being transphobic and just being a manipulative person. However, there are two very important points in the document that I want to share with you as to why I think this is one of the most disturbed people to have ever graced the FNAF community. For one, his fetishes are listed here as enjoys the idea of women or men being and doing for stress pleasure, enjoys the idea of killing as a stress fetish, and finally, enjoys the idea of having sex with dead bodies. Now, in terms of what we discussed with Dormitibus and what we have found through this expose of his sex life, we can see where this guy gets his ideas for the game. Now, since I don't have access to the document itself, I can't say for sure what kind of evidence that they collected to prove this to be true. But considering the direct correlation that Garvey has to these specific fetishes, including the fact that Garvey did naughty things to a child in the game, game's canon, I can't help but to think that this would explain quite a bit. <laughs> but what really gets fucked up isn't even that he has these supposed fetishes, but what was revealed later through his Discord. In private DMs with an anonymous user, Nietzsche was exposed for having charged conversations with a 12-year-old girl. And as if you thought this couldn't get any grosser. There they are. Those are his nudes that he sent to a 12 year old. Wonderful. I hate this. So in terms of the response to all of this, Nietzsche just kind of, you know, up and disappeared from the internet. And it's like, if you wanted to make yourself look more guilty, the best thing you can do is run off the face of the internet. Now, personally, I'm of the belief that the allegations are credible. So, you know, don't try to misconstrue what I have to say next. So 
I do believe that this person is a danger to the community and needs to be held accountable to what he has said to the 12 year old specifically. But I kind of wish the document was public. Possible the only available screenshots out there are in an unlisted YouTube video. And I just want to provide more than just these screenshots because everyone else who talks about this situation only uses these screenshots. Even though we don't get to see what Nietzsche actually says about his fetishes. And also, and the most important part, is that I don't want people to think I just stole this entire video idea from- Oh yeah. Listen, I scripted this a while ago before his video came out. And I would have gotten to it sooner if it weren't for those meddling animatronics and that stupid dog. <laughs> been a yeah and they'll see you all next time in conclusion don't play this game it sucks also the man behind the slaughter <laughs> I, I mean the game yeah they're also bad and they suck okay so for real though i'd like to redirect this in a more positive direction for just a minute because i know having all of these bad apples in the community makes all of us collectively look really bad it also doesn't help that some of the largest figureheads seem to come out as the creepiest fucking weirdos. I mean, we had the creator of Flumpties get exposed for chatting with a 13 year old. And his games were massive and some of my favorite parody fan games out there. And Scrippus McGrippus also came out recently to say that they were being a creepy weirdo as well. And it's like, can these fucking assholes stop making my dad look bad? Seriously, this is annoying. But I also need you guys to understand this as well, that it's not just FNAF, it's every community online that has ever existed. They're going to have bad actors in there, some harboring them more than others. And I really think it comes down to like the type of environment that these communities have that determine the frequency in which this stuff happens. FNAF is by no means a kid's game. I, I mentioned this in my last video as well, but even though this isn't a kid's game, it's definitely become a popular franchise for kids, with a lot of the merchandise even advertising itself to kids heavily with plushies and board games and action figures and kids underwear. For some reason, Walmart, what are you doing? But despite the disturbing nature of these games, kids are heavily prominent in the community. And I think because this is a kid-dominated space that revolves around a story where horrible things happen to kids, I think it's even more enticing for these bad actors to lure and groom children into these type of situations. Mainly because they believe with the horror and implied violence of the game, that kids would already be mature enough to handle subjects like child murder. So it's like, 
fuck it, maybe they can be susceptible to e-sex while we're at it. But I think the adults in the community, at the very least, should stand up against this and pick up the slack. Because just because kids are being exposed to a horror story about animatronics and dead children doesn't mean that should lead them down a pipeline into this type of territory. And I believe most of the community knows this is a problem and can agree that there should be more protection for kids in the community. I don't think that the solution should be to bar all kids out of the FNAF community since the advertising and the merchandise side of FNAF has already taken liberties to market this game to kids and think that this is a kids franchise. But I think solutions to all of this are already underway, with scaring people like Nietzsche out of the community and off of the internet entirely. The bright side that I can say is that at the very least, in the FNAF community, most of Five Nights at Freddy's freaks that have been exposed in the past few years have been chased completely off the internet and never to be seen again. So the community at the very least scores a W for that. So in conclusion, uh, fuck Nietzsche and fuck this game. The end. Ooh.